Okay, so hello and welcome back. Today, this is, I believe, class six, seven. Is this class seven? I think it says class seven. Um, we need to pray because we've got a lot to learn and uh, we need the Holy Spirit to teach us. So <laughs> let's ask the Lord to come and be part of our time together and we'll jump in. We've got a lot to cover tonight. It's going to be a fun night. Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you'd come and be with us. Lord, we declare Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord over our learning. He's Lord over this house. God, I just pray that uh, you'd shield and protect us and our family members, our children, children's children, nieces, nephews, brothers, sisters, parents, grandparents. Just watch over all of our households so that we have a time tonight that's not bothered by uh, interference, Lord. Watch over us. God, I pray for everybody that's joined us online, that you'd be with them and, and protect them and shield them as well and protect their connections as they're jumping in with this, Lord God. Father, I ask that uh, you'd give us a real sense of your presence while we're studying, that you'd open our eyes, open our hearts, help us to receive your truth and to see things that maybe we just haven't seen before, God. I pray that you'd use your word to prepare our hearts and to prepare us for your coming, Lord. So just say, come and be here. Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. Uh, Jesus said that you'd teach us all things and remind us of everything that he said, and we ask you for that tonight. So, Father, thank you. Thank you for everything, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Let me put my Do Not Disturb sign on here on my phone, on my computer. All right. Oh, Diane, you can't hear? Yeah, we're, I'm talking. <laughs> D, are you able to hear me okay? Yeah, okay. <laughs> I don't exactly know. Maybe, I don't, yeah, I don't know. Here, we'll do this. Uh, no, I think, I think, I think Diane just needs to turn her volume up. I don't think I have any way to do it for her, unfortunately. Um, okay, so the revelation here. We're going to jump in. If you remember where we left off last week, uh, we left off, we had done Revelation 4 and Revelation 5, and uh, we talked about the throne of heaven. We had a chance to see the throne. We had a chance to see the beasts. Uh, if you watched the video from last week, which I, if you were here, there would have been no reason necessarily to. But I did a horrible job at a couple places. I was watching and I ended up putting balloons in the video because I'm like, good grief, Buck, man, what in the world was I thinking? So at one point we were talking about, just as a reminder, as a refresher from last week, uh, we were talking about uh, the different types of angels. We did kind of a small angelology course, if you remember. And, uh, and I had my angels reversed and I had to correct that. Uh, but we had angels that had four wings. We had angels that had six wings. Uh, the angels that were four-winged were cherub angels. The angels that were six-winged were seraph angels. Uh, and then the angels that we had in the Revelation were called beasts. Not to be confused with the beast of the Revelation, which is the bad guy, right? Uh, but the reason that they were called beasts was because they looked like creatures, but they had eyes all over them. Uh, they had four wings, uh, or six wings, pardon me. They had, let's go, we better go look and see so I don't mess it up again. Um, let's see here. So chapter four, verse six, it says, uh, before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal in the midst of the throne, round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. The first beast was like a lion, the second like a calf, the third had a face as a man, the fourth was like a flying eagle. The four beasts each had six wings. So we looked at that and we also looked and compared that to the creatures that were in Ezekiel. And we talked about those, if you remember. And so uh, one of the things that we discussed was the fact that cherub angels are uh, warring angels that seraph angels are messenger angels. So scripture says the seraph angel has six wings. It says with two they cover their eyes, two they cover their feet, and with two they fly. The reason why that's the case is out of respect of the Lord. They're in God's presence. 
They cover their eye, they cover their face with two of their wings. They cover their feet out of respect to the Lord. Oftentimes in the Old Testament, you might remember when somebody would enter the Lord's presence, God would say something like, or the person would respond this way, with Moses, the Lord said, take off your shoes because the place where you're standing is holy, right? Um, <clears throat> so uh, there is a connection between respecting the holiness of God and what we do with our feet, right? Uh, sometimes you might feel the Lord's presence and, you know, and in your prayer time, maybe you lay flat on the ground and you just lay before the Lord on your face because you feel like that's the appropriate way to address God when you're praying, right? That's another example of, uh, another example of respecting the Lord's holiness, right? So the angels, the seraph angels, would cover their face out of respect to the Lord. They'd cover their feet out of respect to the Lord, and then they would, they would maintain or fly with the two wings that they had left. The cherub angels were the fighting angels. They had four wings. We also talked about a couple of examples. So Gabriel came to Mary. Gabriel was a messenger angel, so Gabriel would have been a seraph angel. Uh, Michael was a warring angel when Daniel prayed, and uh, God sent a response back to Daniel, and the angel with the, ma with the response from the Lord could not get through because... <clears throat> The prince of the power of the air of Persia, the, de the demonic spirit of Persia that was over Persia, uh, would not allow the angel to pass through. So we learned from that example, and we didn't cover this in a lot of detail, but we learned from that example in Daniel that there is an authority structure of the angelic, that there is a hierarchy, and that the hierarchy evidently existed before the angelic host chose to rebel against God, but that even though they rebelled against God. God did not remove that authority from that angel. The reason I say that is this. Um, all authority comes from God, first of all. Scripture says that. All power and authority are his. So, and he created all things for his own pleasure. Colossians 1 says Jesus is the firstborn before all things. Everything serves him. It's all his. Uh, but in that scripture in Daniel, we have an example of an elect angel from God who has a message from God, who's been sent on command of God to take the message to Daniel so that Daniel could have an answer to his prayer. But he was withstood for three weeks, for 21 days. It says that he was withstood by the power of the prince of the power of the year Persia and that he was not allowed through the heavenlies until the chief angel, which would have been Michael, because Michael is an archangel, uh, until Michael came and allowed him through that barrier. So finally, the angel was coming. The angel says, look, Daniel... I was dispatched the moment that you prayed. God heard your prayer, and he sent me to you with this answer. But I was withstood for 21 days. Right? So we have this demonic spirit that had more authority than the, than the angel that was sent by God. And that angel had to wait for an angel with higher authority to come and allow him through. So there is a structure. There is an authority. There is So when, when Paul speaks about principalities and powers, he says that we war not against flesh and blood, but against rulers of darkness, against principalities and powers, and against spirits that elevate themselves in high places, right? Um, when, we, when we begin to grasp that, we see that the angelic truly does play part in every one of our lives every day. We deal with the demonic on a daily basis, and if we deal with the demonic, we have to assume we probably deal with the elect angels as well, which is why Paul said, Entertain guests because you never know when it's going to be an angel unawares, right? So we are fairly self-focused in America. Uh, we don't think about this, but in other countries, this is very much a part of their daily life. Um, so it's just one of those things, as Americans, we've got to stop thinking about ourselves and the fact that we have absolute freedom and the fact that we have all these wonderful things. We have a great country. It's true. But that does not mean that we are without the demonic, and it does not mean we don't interact with angels on a daily basis. So, so what we have here now, oh, and I did remind you, there's a book called Angels, Elect, and Evil. And I told you that's a great book. If you want to read a book on angels that gives you a great scriptural rundown, uh, go buy a copy of it and go through it. Awesome book. Uh, so the, we talked about the angels. We talked about the beasts. We talked about the the the. the huge amount of sound, the noise, everything that's going on, millions upon millions of angels uh, that, are, that are there. Uh, we talked about Jesus 
being the lamb that looked as though he had been slain. It says the scripture identifies when John sees Jesus in front of the throne. He says, and I beheld a lamb as if it had been slain, which would have meant that his neck had been cut, probably had blood coming down his chest, because that would have been what happened with a lamb. That's what they would do. They'd pull the neck up, they slice the neck, they drain the blood into a basin, they would uh, skin the lamb, and then they would roast it. So that's the gist of what happens, right? So when John saw Jesus, he saw him as a lamb that had been slain, which would likely mean that he had a throat cut, had blood on himself. It also says that he had seven eyes. We talked briefly, well, I say briefly, we talked for a little bit about the seven eyes of Jesus being the seven spirits of God. Not the seven angels of the churches, but the seven spirits of God. The seven spirits are never called angels. They're only ever called spirits. And they're only referenced three times. We see them all three times in the first five books of the Revelation. Uh, one person had asked about it, whether that was the same uh, as the sevenfold. There's, a, there's a, an entity, or, uh, a, an interpretation of Scripture that's identified as the sevenfold Spirit of God in Isaiah 11. Uh, and, and we talked about that, about the, the Spirit of mercy and grace, the Spirit of power. I can't remember what the rest of it is. My mind's blank. But uh, I don't, and we talked about why I don't think that's the same thing. I, I don't. First of all, I think you have to kind of stretch that Isaiah 11 Scripture to make it fit. So, and we can talk about that in more detail if you know what I'm talking about. If you don't, go read Isaiah 11. Go read about the, go read, you know, the, the spirits of the Lord in, uh, in the Revelation and see what you think. But we can talk about it in detail if you weren't here last week. Or go watch the video. It's out there too. Uh, so by the time we got done, we were ready to go to the seven seals. I can't wait. Can't wait. This is fun. Good stuff. Meat ahead. I hope you guys are carnivores because tonight we have meat. Uh, so we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about, before I go, does anybody have questions from last week, thinking something you've been chewing on, anybody online, um, questions, thoughts, anything from last week? Nope. 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 Okay. Awesome. Uh, there was one other thing I was going to share. Uh, let me think. What was it? Um, the transitive property. Let's cover that again real quick because we're going to use it. <clears throat> Last week we talked about the transitive property. The transitive property is actually, you, you use this in geometry, right? And that is, if you've got an object here that is equal to something, and you've got an object here that's equal to something, then these two things have to be equal by definition. So if we have 3 minus 1 equals 2, and we have 4 minus 2 equals 2, we can say that 3 minus 1 is the same thing as 4 minus 2, right? Does that make sense? Transitive property. So we transition from one thing to the next. We start here, we end here. We start here, we end here. If, these, if this and this share a same common middle point, then the two ends have to be the same. We, we talked about how that fit with the angels because we talked about the angels having the face of an eagle, a, a, a lion, a man, and an ox. And then another place in the same book in Ezekiel, it said eagle, lion, man, cherub. So because we have eagle, lion, man in both sides, and the only thing that's different between the two, talking about the same angel, talking about a cherub angel, is that one says that he looked like an ox and the other one said he looked like a cherub. We make the assumption then because the, everything else was the same, all things withstanding, that an ox and a cherub must look somewhat like each other. That was an example <clears throat> that was an example of that property. And we'll run into this more as we keep going through the revelation. So just kind of file that away in the back of your mind. Okay, that's all the housekeeping from last week. Chapter 6, here we go. <coughs> Chapter 6. Oh. Let's see here. All right. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals. So just a note real quick, it says one of the seals. It doesn't say which seal, right? So there's not a first, second, third, fourth, fifth. When it starts like this, all we see is one. It says one, and I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals. So we're going to have to make, <clears throat> we're going to have to make an assumption here. We're going to assume for the sake of continuation here, that he started at the beginning and is just working his way through, okay? Because we don't have any way to know. I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals, I heard as it were the noise of thunder. One of the four beasts, which would be the four angelic creatures that had eyes all over themselves, saying, come and see. 
And I saw, and I beheld a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. That's it. That's what we know about the first horseman of the apocalypse. There's all, there's all sorts <coughs> of, of, uh, of assumptions that we could make, right? But let's, let's deal with some of the uh, symbology that we do know from Scripture. First of all, we know that white typically represents purity. Anytime you see something white, generally represents something that's identified as pure. Uh, we're given white robes. Uh, Jesus was in a white robe. Um, the, uh, though your sins be as scarlet, they will be made white as snow, right? Righteousness. Uh, so when you look at scripture, white typically means cleanliness, clean, uh, forgiven, purity, things like that, holiness, right? Uh, horse, horses were not used uh, throughout the entire Middle Eastern world. Camels, goats, there are other ways of traveling, mules, donkeys, right? Horses were a very Roman type of creature. And it wasn't that there were no horses. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that you'll see when you look in Scripture, you're going to see references to other creatures as well, not just horses. Uh, but a horse typically would represent uh, affluence, power, uh, you, you've got money, you know, there are things about a horse. So what we see with this is that we have somebody who's identified as clean, pure, with a position of authority, and that he's going out. But it specifically says uh, that he sat on it, he had a bow. Note that there were no arrows, right? It didn't say he had a bow and arrow, it said that he had a bow. And that a crown was given to him, which meant that a crown, that he did not have a crown in and of himself prior to that point, Right? So this is an entity, a person, uh, or persons, whatever it represents, that is somebody who's been empowered to go forth with the appearance of a warrior, albeit is really an invalid warrior because he has no way to hurt anybody. So we're gonna, I'm going to stop there on that because what we're going to start doing is we're going to look for patterns. And in just a minute, we're going to get through three horses, and then we're going to go and we're going to find another pattern that matches and we're going to tie the two together and we're going to do the boom, boom in the middle part, right? Like you just talked about. We're going to use that rule to start making sense out of this. So let's talk to the second. Th let's talk. Let's look at the second one. Verse three. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, come and see. There went out another horse. Now remember, so the first horse, ta -ding, ta -ding, ta -ding, ta -ding, ta -ding, he's taken off from the gate. And now here's the next horse right behind it. So the first one, we don't have anything that suggests that the first horse ceased to exist or stopped running at the time the second horse began, right? So I think what we need to assume is that the horse takes off and starts running, the next one follows behind it, the next one follows behind it, and they just keep going like a train, right? <coughs> Not together, though. Like no, they would be one after the next, right, in sequence. Uh, when he had opened the second, I heard the second beast say, come and see, and there went another horse that was red. And power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and they, uh, sorry, uh, and that they should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. So now we have a man on a horse that is blood red, right? Uh, Though your sins be as scarlet, right? We're talking about scarlet. There is a difference between scarlet and red, but the color palette heads the same direction. Just looking for ways that we can make sense out of this. He does have a sword. And uh, he is going out, and we know that he's going out to make war. The first person said nothing about war, and yet he had a bow. The second person we know is going out for war because that is what that person is intended to do. The horse, the man, everything is intended to be war. Let's go to the next one. When he had opened the third seal, I heard a third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see that you do not hurt the oil and the wine. Okay, so black, again, what do we have here? Black, death, black, uh, darkness, sin, right? Uh, this, this entity is responsible for interactions with food. And we're going to talk about this more in a minute. But I want to stop now that we've got the three horsemen. These three, first three are out of the chute. And we've got the white horse that had the appearance of white, that had the man had the appearance of white, had a bow with no arrows, 
uh, a crown was given to him, meaning that he was given the ability to, to uh, at, at, a, at a minimum, he was given the ability to look like a king, whether he was a king or not, or was royalty. The second one was the warrior going out to make battle, uh, and a sword was given to him. And then the third one had something to do with food. Right. So let's go back and see what Jesus said, because Jesus talks about this in Matthew 24. And we've already read this. So go back to Matthew 24, and let's start making some parallels here. So, as you recall, we started this whole class in Matthew 24. If you don't, if you don't, if you don't recall the amount of time that we spent, you can go back and watch the first four videos, and you can go through all of it to refresh your memory. But if you remember, the disciples start off with Jesus. Jesus is in the temple, uh, is in the temple complex. Uh, Jesus says, "You see all these buildings. Not one of these will remain. Not one stone will remain on top of another." I pointed you to an extra biblical source written by Josephus, who was a historian. And the seventh book of, the, of Josephus, chapter 1, verse 1, begins the destruction of Jerusalem. And he talks about how the city was leveled and there was no stone left upon another. When, <clears throat> when you continue looking, Jesus then walks with the disciples to the Mount of Olives. And, and we talked about that being a Sabbath day's journey, about three quarters of a mile walk. Less than 2,000 steps to get there from where they were at the temple to the Mount of Olives. And somewhere along the way, we have this sense that the disciples were talking because when they get to the Mount, they say, Jesus, what's the sign of your coming? When will these things be? And what's the end of the age? I got the first two backwards. It's when will these things be? What's the sign of your coming? And when's the end of the age? The very first thing Jesus says is what? Don't be deceived. The very first thing that Jesus responds to them with is don't be deceived. Jesus was not as concerned about other things as he was about them being deceived because the very first thing that came out of his mouth was don't be deceived. And Jesus doesn't waste words, right? But then Jesus says this, <clears throat> Take heed that no man deceives you, for many will come in my name saying I'm Christ and will deceive many. What happens after that? And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, these things must come to pass, for the end is not yet. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. What's after that? There will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. Now let's go back and look at the horses. The first horse was a white horse. Looks righteous, looks godly, given a crown, had a bow with no arrows. That would be a great example of a false prophet. Has no authority, has no power, but has the appearance of it. Jesus says the first thing that's going to happen, many will come in my name saying I'm Christ and will deceive many. What does Jesus look like when he comes back? We're going to find out when we get to Revelation 19, but he's riding a white horse and he's wearing white and he has a sash across his chest that says King of Kings and Lord of Lords and he has a crown on his head and what is he carrying? He has a sword coming out of his mouth. This guy has this little tiny arrow or tiny bow or whatever size it was, but he has no arrows that go along with it. So, it's somebody that looks like Jesus will look when Jesus comes back, but it's not Jesus, the first horse. So I think the first one is what Jesus says here. Many will come in my name saying I'm Christ will deceive many. Then what happens? The red horse says that he was sent forth to make war and he was given a sword. What's the second thing Jesus said? You'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled. These things must come to pass. The end is not yet. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Then what happens? The third horseman, the black horse, says that he went out, dude dealt with food. Barley, uh, you know, uh, uh, met, or, uh, uh, let's read what it said again because I'm going to get it wrong. Uh, he that sat on it had a pair of balances in his hand. Verse 6 of chapter 6 says, I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts saying, A measure of wheat for a penny, three measures of barley for a penny, and see that you don't hurt the oil and the wine. Jesus says the next thing is going to happen. You're going to have false prophets. Then you're going to have war. Then you're going to have famines and pestilence. The third horse we have here, I'm wondering, is it famine? Well, how do we know if the third horseman is famine? How can we tell from the revelation whether this is a time of great affluence or a time of famine? Because when you read chapter 6, verse 6, it says, I heard a voice in the midst of the four be saying, a measure of wheat for a penny, three measures of barley for a penny, and see that you hurt not the oil and the wine. Now, if we interpret this based on today's standards, which there's nothing wrong with us attempting to do that, 
then three measures of bar or a, a measure of wheat uh, for a penny is a pretty decent deal. If I can get a measure of wheat for a penny, I, you can't even buy a piece of bubble gum for a penny for Pete's sake. You can get enough to make a, I mean, a, a measure would be enough to make a loaf of bread, more than that. Three measures of barley, that'd be three loaves of bread for a penny. That, that actually sounds like cheap. That, that sounds like time, a time of affluence, like a time of great wealth, if you look at it from that vantage point. But then we get to the second part of this verse, and that's where we run into the conflict. Because it says here, and, and see that you do not hurt the oil and the wine. So now we have to ask the question, well, if this is the time of affluence, why would the oil and the wine be hurt? Because oil and wine are symbols of affluence. If you look at, <clears throat> if you look at the wedding feast, what did they have? Jesus makes this amazing wine, and everybody's raving about how they saved the best for last, right? Uh, there's, a, there's an old song, uh, so it's, those of you that have been through my class before, you'll know that every once in a while I just pop off into a song because there's scripture that reminds me of it. But there's this old song, it was like this. He poured in the oil and the wine, the kind that restoreth my soul. You know that song, anybody? Great song, amazing song, wonderful song. But the whole point of that song was that we, when you look in scripture, the oil and the wine are representative of, of, of wealth, affluence, healing, right? So this scripture says, a measure of wheat for a penny, three measures of barley for a penny, and see that you do not hurt the oil and the wine, which suggests that if things would have gone the way that they would have naturally gone, what is scripture saying without saying it? We've talked about this before. The woman, we are back in Matthew 24. <clears throat> Woe to you who are with child and to those of you that give suck. What, what is the commonality between a woman who's just in her gestation period for pregnancy and a woman who is breastfeeding her child? Yeah, nutrition. Malnutrition and water. You don't have enough food, you don't have enough water, you're not going to let your, the baby in your womb is not going to grow. You don't have enough food, you don't have enough water, your breasts are going to dry up, you're not going to be able to milk. So Jesus is saying, woe to you who are with child, woe to you who are breastfeeding during the day that you must flee from the beast because those times are going to be hard. And he's saying without saying it, you're going to be, it's going to be difficult to get food and water. This is another one of those scriptures. What is Jesus saying in the revelation here without saying it? And see that you hurt not the oil and the wine, which means had he not said that, had God not intervened, the natural outcome would have been that the oil and wine would have been hurt. But there is a commandment from the Lord to this angelic creature, this man, this entity on this horse that says, you're going to go do what you're going to do, but you cannot touch the oil and you cannot touch the wine. Which means that his intent is to destroy. His intent is to eradicate. And he's been withholden from doing that. So that's the first sign that we have that this is actually talking about famine and not affluence. The second thing that we have to look at is letting Scripture interpret Scripture. That's, we want to go back to this over and over and over again. Let Scripture interpret Scripture. Where do we have an example of a penny that we can use in Scripture? And let's go to Matthew 20. Because the exact same Greek word is used in Matthew 20. And we have a lot of detail in Matthew 20 that we can look at. So let's start... <coughs> Matthew 20, chapter 20, verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man that is a householder, which went, went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his yard. And when he had agreed with the laborers, identification here, he had agreed with laborers. So let's identify what a laborer is. Laborer. Somebody that we, if I have a business and I hire a laborer, it's a contractual agreement. I expect that person to do what they say they're going to do. They expect me to give them what I said I would give them. Laborer, right? Volunteer, not the same thing. You volunteer someplace, you have the freedom to leave whenever you want to, and if it causes difficulty for somebody else, that's their issue. It's not yours. doesn't mean that you're a good steward, but you can do it. Laborer, there's a contractual obligation. So, We've got, this, we've got the, the householder here that's making a contractual obligation. He said, when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. 
And he went out about the third hour, and he saw others standing in the marketplace. And he said to them, go into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, I'll give you. He did not make a contractual obligation with those, with the second group. He just said, I'm going to look at it. You're going to trust me. And if you trust me, then go work. And if you don't trust me, then take off and don't. But if you trust me, go, and whatever seems right, I'll pay you at the end of the day. <clears throat> then he went out about the third hour, saw others standing. He said to them, go also to the vineyard. Whatsoever's right, I'll give you. And they went their way. Again, he went out about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, and he did likewise. So just to put this in perspective, the day generally when you see the third, sixth, ninth hours, it starts from 6 a.m., and it goes. Because think about it from a sundial, right? Sun up to sundown, uh, think of a half circle. So half circle, you got three, six, nine, twelve, right? So the, the first hour of the day would be six. Third hour of the day would be nine. Sixth hour of the day would be twelve. Ninth hour of the day would be three o'clock in the afternoon. The end of the day would be 6 p.m. That's a pretty good gauge for how this works. Now, it did fluctuate a little bit because of sunrise and sundown, right? But that's the, the overall. So about the 11th hour, which means one hour before the workday is done, because that's a 12-hour workday, and we complain about eight, right? The 11th hour, he went out, found others standing idle, and said to them, why are you standing here idle? They said to him, verse 7, because no man has hired us. And he says to them, go into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that will I give you. So when he was... So when the evening was come, the Lord of the vineyard said to his steward, Call the laborers and give them their hire, beginning from the last even to the first. When they that came were that were hired at the eleventh hour, they received each man a penny. They got a penny for working an hour. But the first, when they came, they supposed that they should receive more. They likewise received every man a penny. So the guys that labored for twelve hours also received a penny. So we can continue going through this, but what we see is this. The penny, the denaria, was the understood equivalent of a day's wages. From this scripture, we have a very good... Now, what we see is that the goodman of the house ends up chastising the people that he hired at first. He said, look, you agreed with me to work for me for a penny for the day, and you went in knowing that's what you were going to get. Why are you judging me because I happen to be a generous man? Can't I be generous and give extra to people if I want to? So what we see, though, is this, this one proof, and that is that the guys that signed up at the very beginning, it was a day's wages. That term, denarian, was a day's wages. That's the term that we use for penny. That's the term that we read in the Revelation when it says a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. It's saying a measure of wheat for a day's wages, three measures of barley for a day's wages, and see that you don't hurt the oil and the wine. So by the time we put all the pieces together, we can see that the third horseman of the apocalypse really is referencing times of famine, times of difficulty for food, and that it will be a day's wages just to get enough wheat for one loaf of bread. That's how high prices are going to go. So if you don't have food on hand of any kind, you should. I mean, not just for this. I mean, if there's ever any, any kind of an emergency, <clears throat> tornado comes through and, and wipes out areas of your city, earthquake happens, floods, whatever, uh, more lockdowns. I mean, God forbid that should happen again. But if things happen, it's good to have six months, nine months worth of food. You can store canned goods for months and months and months. I mean, they were eating canned goods in the Korean War that was canned during World War II. I mean, canned goods last a long time. Even when, they, even when it's past the, the date, you can still eat it, right? Mm -hmm. So it's one of these things, the reason I bring that up is this. When we're reading this, we have to ask our, ourselves the question, are we the generation or not? We don't know. We can look at it and we can start making some estimations. Have we seen false Christs? Yes. Are we seeing even more of them? We are. There's a guy over in Israel right now that's got everybody's attention because he's going around doing miracles, healing people. You know, I mean, it's like, it's so fascinating when you see these things, people are calling him Messiah. You know, they're saying, look, this has got to be the guy, right? When you end up having these types of world events, it's like, okay, well, we can maybe check that one off. We're going to start seeing these things, right? 
Do we see wars and rumors of wars? Yeah, we see wars and rumors of wars. Absolutely. Kingdom against kingdom is already happening. Has never stopped. But these are in sequence. So we've got false prophets. We've got the king. We've got the wars and rumors of wars. The next thing, if we're the generation, is going to be famines. Do we see famines in the world? Absolutely we do. Have we seen famines here? We're starting to. Have you guys tried to buy a pound of butter recently? It's up to $6 for a pound of butter if you're going to get the... the Organic butter, it's six pounds. Mary just went to the store yesterday to buy food. <clears throat> Meat, eggs, have you guys seen the price of eggs? Yeah, we're gonna, I mean, little things. We just have to watch because it's the boiling frog effect, right? If we wait and go back to what Jesus said in Matthew 25, Matthew, end of Matthew 24 and all the way through Matthew 25, Jesus said, be prepared, be prepared, be prepared, be prepared, be prepared, be prepared. Over and over and over again, Jesus said, be prepared. If we think that we can wait until we know we're in the end times to be prepared, it will be too late. The, bride, the, the bridegroom came and the virgins who didn't know how long it was going to take were the ones that went into the wedding. The ones who waited until the bridegroom was there or they heard that the bridegroom was coming it wasn't even the bridegroom was there the cry went out at midnight behold the bridegroom comes go out and meet him the ones who waited and did not prepare did not go in the ones who did not know when it would happen and were just prepared as a lifestyle were the ones that were allowed in <clears throat> i'm just saying i think the reason the lord put this in scripture for us is so that we aren't caught off guard we prepare now. You know what? If we never need it, we can give the food away, right? You don't need it, give it away. On your deathbed, assign all of your food to your neighbors. They will love you. What a great thing. Buck died and we got a bunch of food, right? How we do it in our family, we have our own store. We have our own goods and we use our goods and we replenish our goods. We cycle our own out based on dates. So I buy a can, we buy a can of beans that are going to expire July of 2023. When we go to the store, we buy. When we see that those July 2023 is coming up, we actually have a list of everything that we've got in our storehouse. And when we see that July 2023 is on that list, we go pull the 2023 beans, we put them in the pantry, and we buy beans, and we put them back. And you just cycle your food out. It just becomes a lifestyle. And you'll never have to worry about it. It'll always be there if you need it. I've got 250 pounds of eggs. Why do you need 250 pounds of eggs? Because that's enough protein for a family of four for two years. There you go. And it stores, has a, a shelf life of infinity because it's dried. You, there's nothing you have to worry about. We have food to help our neighbors. If our neighbors need food, we've got enough to be able to help them. It's not just about us either, right? So I'm just saying, that when we see scriptures like this, it's not like we should read it and go, oh, that's nice, what a great thought. It's actually something that we're supposed to execute. <laughs> Do something with the knowledge. Live a lifestyle of preparedness so that if it happens and you don't see it coming, you don't have to worry about it. Let's keep going. <clears throat> the next one. And when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. Now, that word in Greek is actually mucus green. So you can kind of use your imagination on what that looks like. His name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him. So here we have what could be, we don't have a whole lot to go on on this, but I'm just going to point this out. This could be an angelic name. And in some versions of the scripture, you'll see that hell and death are capitalized. And the reason they are is because the interpreters felt like these were names of spiritual entities, not just experiences. If they were experiences, death specifically was an experience, it would have been a lowercase d. And because hell follows after him, the, the picture that we have is this horse that comes out on a mucus green horse and death is on this horse, and there is another rider behind him, or perhaps on the horse with him, and there's death in the front and hell in the back. And so you see it as two people or two entities, maybe two angelic hosts. 
When he opened the, well, let's see here, and I looked and behold the pale horse, his name that sat on him, the, the name of the one sitting on the horse was called death. And hell followed with him. Power was given to them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and with the beasts of the earth. Now, this is an interesting one because if you look at it, <coughs> if you look at this, we've already covered the first couple, right? This says power was given to him, power was given to them, pardon me, over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword. Have we had a horse that's already been given a sword to kill? Yeah. We did. We had the red one. With hunger, do we have one that's got famine? We did, the black horse that was just before it. So the first two powers, superpowers, that this entity is given, whether it's angelic or otherwise, the first two superpowers this person, this entity is given is to is are repeats of the last two horses. But then there are two more that are added to this guy. It says that he's given power to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and with the beasts of the field. Now, how do you kill with death? <laughs> it seems kind of like, it seems kind of like using the same word to define itself, like killing you with killing, right? But it says that, they were, that he was given, or they, death and hell, were given the power to kill with death. And this is one that I had to ponder for a while. Uh, the sword I think we can get, and the famine I think we can get. But ha let's look at it this way, that this, uh, that this creature, this entity, was given the ability to kill with death experiences, right? There was a, there, um, uh, in the news, I'm just going to pick something out of my head I just thought of. In the news, we, you, you've seen the uh, soccer players, <laughs> they just die on the field. Unexpected, nobody knows why just happens um, areas uh, up in Ohio where they had the toxic spills up there right people I don't know if people have died from that yet I haven't paid attention to it but I wouldn't be surprised if they had but certainly creatures have I know that there have been lots of birds that they found dead all sorts of uh, entities that had been living no longer living because of the chemical spill right what happened they just died right? Because of the chemical spills. Um, what I think this is saying is that there will be mass death experiences where they'll just happen. Like it will be, it'll be something maybe we'll be able to put our finger on it. Maybe we won't. I don't know. But what will happen is these experiences will become more and more pronounced that people will just die, that they will die from death. It's just like, they just died. Like why'd they die? We don't know. They just, they just died. I think that's what this is saying. So there will be experiences where there will be the sword, there will be battle, people will die in battle. There will be experiences where people die because of famine. There will be experiences where people just fall over dead and we won't know why. And then there's this other one that says that, that the beasts of the field. It says that, uh, and with the beasts of the earth. It says that they were given the power to kill with the beasts of the earth. This was another one that I had to think about for a little while. And this makes more sense when you consider the COVID lockdowns that we had and what happened to some, if you were watching the news, there were areas of India where baboons were coming into cities and they were, and they were being aggressive. Monkeys were coming in to the cities and being aggressive with humans taking their food as they were walking down the street because all the trash that they would normally live off of wasn't there because there was so much lockdown happening all the waste that would normally be accessible to these creatures to eat was not accessible. And so these animals were becoming fairly forceful because their food sources were that they were used to were drying up. They were inaccessible, inaccessible. And so they were attacking humans. The other thing that we know about animals is that when animals eat human flesh, if they get a flavor for it, they will attack humans to consume more. So when I read this one, I'm thinking that what this is talking about is likely, perhaps there's a large death experience, animals end up eating humans, getting the taste of it, and then they end up attacking humans because of it, or where their food 
has diminished and they begin attacking people for food because they don't have enough food themselves the way they're used to getting it. So I think the, I, in either case, I think that they, these dovetail with each other. Like the people that die by death and the animals attacking, I think, could be linked together, right? But the interesting part about this horse, about this horse is, is this. It says that he... So I look and behold a pale horse, his name that sat on him was death and hell, followed with him. Power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth. This is the only place in the entire book of the Revelation where the term fourth is used. It's never used any place else. You see third, you see all, you never see fourth, except for this verse. So we have to ask ourselves a question. Is fourth a percentage or could fourth be an ordinal value? An ordinal value means first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. Could it be positional? Since fourth is never used anywhere else in the Revelation, I began asking myself the question, I wonder if this could be an ordinal value. Could it be the fourth part of the earth? If this references the fourth part of the earth, it also helps make sense out of why the, the uh, second and third horsemen, the one with the sword and the famines are restated because it could be that those prior experiences maybe didn't hit the fourth or the writer of the book of the Revelation as inspired by God is making the point to say those that are on the fourth part of the earth will experience these for sure, right? So I began looking at maps. I went all the way back to 1000 BC. There, there is no reference to anything other than three areas of the world. It was always ever known as the three parts of the earth. At the time that John wrote the book of the Revelation, it was known as the three parts of the earth. That's all there was. There was Asia, Europa, and Libya. Africa was not yet named Africa at that point. Africa didn't receive the name Africa until a couple of hundred years AD. <clears throat> So at the time this would have been written, there would only have been three parts of the earth. And they were known as the three parts of the earth. Asia was the first part, Europa was the second part, Libya was the third part. So if you're John, and put yourself in John's position, you would have grown up, you would have seen maps, Africa looked different. The only part that was mapped about 100 AD, you had everything just north of, I'd say probably the top 25% of Africa had been mapped. It wasn't the African continent that we know right now. But you had pretty much the entire Asia continent. You had the majority of the European continent and the top 25% of Africa. So that would have been the map that John would have seen as a child growing up in school, whatever the case may have been. If you're John and you're seeing this and these, and we don't know how he saw this, but if he's somehow seeing these things unfold, what if, what if it were you? You're used to the three parts of the earth. You know Asia, Europa, and Libya. Asia, Europa, and Libya, right? And you see this land mass out here, and the fourth horseman goes over here. And you see the horseman go here. And you're like, well, I know what this is. What are you gonna call this? There's no name for it. It, it would be known the fourth part of the earth because the three parts of the earth were Asia, Europa, and Libya, and that's what they were known as, the three parts of the earth. The fourth part of the earth would have to be this strip of land out here that has no name because it's not identified yet and wouldn't be identified until the 1400s by the Wolzemuller maps, which would be known as the Americas because the Americas became the fourth part of the world, the fourth part of the earth. So I look at this... And I've become convinced that the fourth horseman of the apocalypse is actually a horseman that's specifically spoken about the United or about the U.S. Maybe U.S. and South America. I think that the fourth one's ours. I think it's going to be specifically what we deal with. Now, I'm telling you that that's me. I can't tell you that that's what Scripture means. I'm just telling you that that's where I've landed, because because it makes sense to me from a from an analytical standpoint. It makes sense why it's called the fourth part 
why the term fourth is never used as a percentage anywhere else, anywhere in the book of Revelation, and why the two of the horsemen are repeated on this horse. So I, I, I had a, I've had a couple of dreams. I'm going to stop and share a couple of dreams with you real quick. Where are we at? 740. Okay. Um, I had a dream that, you know, these come out of nowhere every once in a while for no reason. Don't have any idea. It's not like I ate pizza and had a weird dream. It just kind of happens. Although last night would have been a great night to have had a dream, and I didn't. We, <clears throat> I was standing. We were here in Oklahoma. I was looking off to the east. And somehow I was able to, in the dream, you know, you can do anything in a dream, right? I was able to see kind of from a zoom, right? I was looking off to the east, and I saw tw- like almost, it was like 12 streams of smoke like this. And they, I, I know I don't have 12, but you have to pretend like I've got two more fingers on each hand here, okay? But they're coming like this. They're spread apart. I'm doing this so you got to get the idea. They're coming down like this. And they land. Boom, boom. Straight down the Mississippi River, and it were then they were atomic bombs, and they, but it was a it was a type of a it was a type of atomic cloud I had never seen before, other than this dream. It was an extremely tall, cylindrical, tall, um, tall cloud with a plume that went way up. So like a normal like the like the normal atomic bomb you may have seen with Hiroshima and Nagasaki videos, things like that. You know, you've got the boom and it goes down and it comes up and then you've got the big mushroom and it's squatty. These were like tall trees and the plumes were smaller, but they were very, very, very tall and the plumes were way up at the top of it. But it was like uh, it was like it was like it was just in sequence. I could see the streams coming, I could see them and they just landed. Boom, 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 boom. And somehow I knew that it was straight down the Mississippi River. How I knew that, I can't tell you. Uh, and then I woke up. That was the dream. And uh, so I called a friend of mine who uh, has a lot of military understanding, has sons who are uh, in the military. And I'm like, hey, have you ever heard of an atomic bomb that does this? He's like, yeah, actually I have. He said, they're, they're what they are, they're, uh, and I'm not going to get this right. Somebody maybe can listen to this or figure this out better than I can. But there, I, what I, the way I recall it was they're cluster bombs, and it's that there. It's a warhead, and I, re, I did do a little bit of research on this. But it's a warhead that on the end of the warhead, they it has six individual bombs on the end of it, and they launch them from submarines. So they go out the submarine, they go up to elevation. When they reach a certain elevation, they break off, and then they're each guided. They're each geo guided. So each of the bombs is geo guided. And so they're individual bombs that are launched off of a submarine. It's a single rocket that goes up with six on the head. It gets up to elevation, and then they launch, and they guide them down from that point. I'm like, and they look like this, and I explained to him what it looked like. He's like, yep, that's exactly what it looks like. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. So, so I, I don't know about, I mean, I don't know where you all land on this, but I think I've thought for a while, and, if, and there's been, there have been some very interesting um, We'll say prophetic words. I'm going to be careful in saying that because you don't know until it happens, right? It's hard to say whether the person's right until it actually occurs. So you just have to take it with a grain of salt and wait and see. But there have been other people who have had a a strong sense that there will be some kind of a nuclear experience that happens on U.S. soil, right? So I look at it and I think, put that in the mix. Just throw that in the mix to try to make sense out of this. If we had some kind of high-level nuclear experience, some kind of an EMP, or we had, I mean, if you were to go down the Mississippi River, the amount of trade that goes up and down the Mississippi River is phenomenal, number one. Uh, It would stop traffic east to west. Everything east of the Mississippi River, there would be no way other than air freight to be able to get uh, food supplies there. There's not a whole lot from the east side of the United States that we need in the Midwest, right? But they definitely need what we have. Uh, living in the Midwest, we're pretty self-sufficient in many ways, but but that would be a way to cut off an entire third of our population, maybe even better than that, from delivery. I mean, the amount of the amount of food difficulties that they would have, the loss of life that would be there, starvation that would happen. I mean, it would be phenomenal, pretty amazing the amount of destruction that would happen just from that one experience. When you think about 
killing by death, people dying for for whatever apparent reason in mass or otherwise, animals eating human flesh, animals attacking human beings because they're hungry. Uh, you know, you put all the pieces together, some of these things start to make more sense. So I'm throwing that out to you. You don't have to agree with me. I'm not telling you that scripture says that the fourth horseman is the Americas. Uh, I'm just saying that I've landed there because it's the only thing that seems to make sense out of it. So it's one more reason why I think it's good to be prepared. Good to get prepared. Just be ready for whatever. And then if it never happens, you don't have to worry about it. But if it is, you're not caught off guard. Okay, let's get, we're going to get through the rest of these here. <clears throat> we only have a little bit more left in, in chapter 6. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Slain for the word of God and for their testimony. They cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, do you not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given to every one of them. And it was said to them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were would be fulfilled. So here we have a group of people who uh, says that I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. You'll notice that the word of Jesus is not in there. It doesn't say that, they test, that it was the testimony of Jesus. It says that it was the word of God and the testimony that they held. I'm pointing that out for a purpose and for a reason. Um, how long will it be until you avenge us? It says white robes, verse 11, white robes were given to every one of them. They were given white robes. In just a minute, we're going to see another crowd of people and they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. These people did not do that. These people were given white robes. They did not wash their robes and make them white in the blood of Jesus. It says that these people were given white robes and they were said to rest yet, which means that they were already yes, resting and they were expected to rest even more. So they had been waiting. By the time we see this picture, this snapshot of them, this little vignette of these people in the altar at, in the, uh, that they um, had been resting for a while. And it says that they would rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants and their brethren should be killed as they were. So these people had lost their lives for the word of God and for the testimony that they carried. We don't know if it said Jesus or not. We have no reference to Jesus. They were given white robes. This is different than the population we're going to see in just a little bit. <clears throat> uh, and so I look at this, and I think that these could be, these could be uh, the saints that were prior to Jesus' resurrection, that these were people who carried the testimony of God, had a faith, preserved God's word, defended it, lost their lives because of it, but perhaps these were individuals that had that were martyred, that were killed prior to Jesus' death and resurrection. I don't know that, but in just a minute we're going to see another group of people, and this next group of people are specifically identified as washing their clothes in the blood of the Lamb and making them white. These guys weren't. So I'm, the only thing that's different between the two that I can see is that maybe they didn't have the blood of the Lamb yet, right? Uh, and behold, when he'd opened the sixth seal, verse 12, <clears throat> there was a great earthquake. The sun became a sackcloth of hair. The moon became as blood. The stars of heaven fell to the earth, even as a fig tree casts her untimely figs when she's shaken of a mighty wind. The heaven departed as a scroll, verse 14, when it's rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their place. And the kings of the earth and the great men, the rich men, the chief captains, the mighty men, and every bondman, every freeman hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who will be able to stand? So we've read this somewhere else before. Do you remember? <clears throat> Where was it? Uh, no. It was Matthew 20 or Matthew 24. We read it in Matthew 24. I was thinking of the king. In the, in the Old Testament? Yeah. Yeah. We read it in Matthew 24, though. Let's go back to Matthew 24. <coughs> Pardon me. Matthew 24. Wonderful 
section of scripture we started on at the beginning of the course. So, Matthew 24. Start with verse 24. There will arise false Christs and false prophets and show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible they would deceive the very elect. Behold, I've told you before. So if they say to you, Behold, he's in the desert, don't go forth. Behold, he's in the secret chambers, don't believe it. For as lightning comes out of the east and shines even to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. The moon will not give her light. The stars will fall from the heaven. The powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. They shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He'll send his angels with the sound of a great with the sound of a trumpet, a great sound of a trumpet, and they'll gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So Jesus identifies that. After the tribulation of those days, the sun will be dark and the moon will not give her light. The stars will fall from the heavens. Then will appear the sign of the coming of the Son of Man. We talked about the sign of the sun and the appearing, actually appearing of the sun. This is the sign of the sun. Then will, then will be, appear the sign of the Son of Man in the heavens. And that's when the rapture happens, the catching away of the church. Look at the revelation here. And I beheld, when he opened the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair. The moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth. Back to Matthew 24. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give her light, and the stars will fall from heaven. The powers of the heavens will be shaken. The stars of the heaven fell to the earth, even as a fig tree casts her untimely figs when she's shaken of a mighty wind. The heaven departed as a scroll when it's rolled together. What does it say after this in Matthew 24? Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Jesus continues and says that all the tribes of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming. What happens here? The heavens departed, verse 14, a scroll of chapter 6 of the Revelation. The heavens departed as a scroll when it's rolled together, every mountain and island removed. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the chief captains, the mighty men, the bondmen, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains. And said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who will be able to stand? Back to Matthew 24, verse 30. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. All the tribes of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man come in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. I think that's the same experience. We've got the sun going dark, the moon going dark, the stars of heaven falling, and the Son of Man appearing in the heavens in both. I think it's the same thing. Matthew 24, Jesus tells us what the sixth seal of the Revelation is telling us. In the sixth seal, we have more detail, though, because we have the, what we have here is a picture that says all of these great and mighty men become so fearful that they hide in the rocks and the dens of the mountains. And Jesus in Matthew 24 said, Then will all the earth says that it says, Then shall the tribes of the earth mourn when they see the Son of Man coming. I think what we have here in as the sixth seal is the catching away of the church. Now the interesting thing that this gives us something to ponder when we come back from break, we're gonna take a break here. When we come back, we'll talk about this. When we start to look at the seven seals, the seven trumpets, which are the next seven things we'll get into, we'll do the seven trumpets starting next week, and the seven vials of God's wrath, what we see is that they are not sequential. They overlap each other. So we can't read the Revelation as a storybook and start at the beginning and read it like a story, like a fictional work or something like that like Tom Sawyer or something. This is a prophetic book. So we have to allow these things to interweave with one another however they do. And we are the ones that have to figure it out. It's the glory of God to conceal a matter and it's the glory of man to figure it out. Right? It's our responsibility to search until we find it out. So as we go through this, we're going to talk about where these overlap and where they interweave with one another. <clears throat> but don't fall into the trap of believing that because we've got seven trumpets and then we have, or because we've got seven seals and then we have seven trumpets and then we have seven vials that they happen in sequence because I don't see that they do.
and we'll talk about why in a minute. Yes, sir. Quick question. Um, Matthew 24, 31. Yep. It says, and he shall send his angel with a great sound of trumpet. Right. And he shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one, one end of the heaven to the other. Yes. That is the tribulation. That... That is the that's the that is the catching away of the church right there. That verse, Matthew twenty four thirty one. He'll send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they'll gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. That's the catching away of the church that we read about in the book of Thessalonians. So that's happening at the sixth seal, though. Is my point? Okay. So when he, when it says that that he's sending his angels with a great sound of the trumpet, the first four seals were the release of the four horsemen. Correct. Am I right? Tracking right? First, yep. Uh -huh. And the, those were all released with the sound of the trumpet, right? The, no, the, the horsemen, we don't have any reference to trumpets in, okay. Okay. on the horsemen. All right, no. Sure the trumpets come starting in two chapters. Okay. Yep. That's a good question. I'm glad you asked. Uh, just to make a point to what he's saying, we don't have any trumpets yet. The only trumpet that we've heard to this point was the beast... When he said, open the seal, he said that, the, if you remember, was it thunder or was it a trumpet? It was thunder, it was no, no, it was thunder there. It was the, the trumpet. The only one I think that we had was in the trumpet was Revelation 4 so far. Yeah, four one. I heard, as it were, a voice of a trumpet talking with me, saying, come up here. Um, and it seemed like we had a trumpet in five, but I'd have to go look. But the horses themselves right now are not heralded by anything other than Jesus opening the seal. That's all we have so far. So we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about, we're going to jump, we're going to read pretty quickly through the first part of Revelation 7, and we're going to go then into the rest of the backside of Revelation 7, which is where we end up experiencing the next group of people that are at the altar. So let's take a five-minute break, seven-minute break, and then we'll come back. Everybody online, go grab your coffee refills. 